Hello and welcome to Addis Matters, our show on Ethiopian current affairs with me, Benya Simeso. The Ethiopian media landscape is changing rapidly. From a moment of boom in 2018, experiencing relative freedom, to financial difficulties as a result of new government policies, it has gone through twists and turns until it reached the recent political upheaval that caused closure of a number of broadcasters. Unlike previous periods, social media is playing a significant role, both in exposing hidden truth and also in spreading extreme views and fake news. In the midst of all this confusion, where is the media sector heading? I have two special guests to go through these difficult questions. Elias Maserat, correspondent to the Associated Press and president of Ethiopian Mass Media Association, and Samuel Bekele, CEO of Spotlight Communication. Thank you both for your time, views, and insights, and welcome to the show. What I would like to do in this session is to look deep into both the politics and economics of media business in this country. If I may, I would like to start with you, Elias. Uh, since uh, Prime Minister Abiy came to power in 2018, a number of reform measures have been taken in this sector. Jailed bloggers and journalists were released. Uh, opposition media houses operating abroad were allowed to enter back into the country. And the global Price Freedom Index, Ethiopia, stepped up, up, stepped up 40 points above its previous score, and Addis Ababa even hosted the World Price Freedom Day in May 2019. Impressive results, just in two years. But it seems the honeymoon is now over. Why do you think we are heading in this direction? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, 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 this is also a reflection of the political atmosphere that we are witnessing here in Ethiopia. Um, as you know, uh, um, uh, since the Prime Minister came to power, despite all the reforms that he has been implementing, uh, including the media, um, uh, the politics in this country has entered into, I think, uh, what uh, I can describe as a very uh, special uh, season. Uh, uh, we are now witnessing uh, different political parties uh, who are acting uh, outside of uh, uh, what is really expected from them uh, and also in line with that. Uh, some of them have been accused of by the government of uh, spreading hate and also division among the public. And I think uh, we have witnessed that one and it is also reflected in the media outlets. We have witnessed the mushrooming of uh, media outlets both here in uh, Addis and also in the regions. But I think lack of professionalism and also attaching themselves to this political party or that one uh, has created an atmosphere in which uh, even if uh, what we are witnessing in this country is not directly caused by uh, media reporters, they are, at, I think, uh, fueling uh, the political uh, the narrative that we are seeing uh, from the political party. So, uh, following that, uh, currently we are seeing, the, uh, we are witnessing the arrest of a number of journalists and, uh, as you previously mentioned, uh, all the hopes uh, that uh, people in this country have for the media is now uh, fading away. And somehow uh, we can uh, witness that uh, there is a backsliding uh, into the previous time. So uh, I think uh, some of these uh, arrests are now, uh, uh, in some journalists have appeared in court and uh, we will see the outcome. But uh, from what we are witnessing uh, so far, I think there are some real concerns, uh, which is also reflected by the CPG and other international rights groups. So, um, yes, the, the, there was some hope uh, at the beginning, but now uh, uh, I think many people agree with me in saying that there are some real fears that uh, there is a backsliding back to the previous time. Mm. Thank you. Samuel, uh, it's, it's 
historical reflection shows us like whenever there is a regime change in this country, there is a brief moment of relative media freedom. In 1991, when EPRDF came to power, the press was released. I mean, there were like more than 70 publications a week, newspapers and uh, magazines. Even in 1974, when the Derg toppled the Haile Selassie regime, there was a bit moment, you know, a brief period of freedom. There was a debate even on state-owned newspapers like Hadizaman on a page what they call uh, Abiyotai Madrak Revolutionary Forum. In 2018, there was a, again, we, we get a similar trend, but it seems now, as Elias mentioned, some journalists are back in prison, a few uh, broadcasting houses are, you know, their license has been confiscated and some of them went out of the country and operating from abroad as before. Is it like, I mean, my, sometimes I wonder, is the, the, the freedom a burden to the media in this country in a way? Or is it the government is using excuses to get back into its natural instincts? I think it's a very good question. The way people are accessing information in Ethiopia right now is there's a massive transformation when it comes to accessing information. Um, people are accessing information quicker and there are a few reliable information that people can access online or on mainstream media. But the first thing we need to consider is there's a radical there's a drastic change when it comes to the media landscape in Ethiopia. What was, forget about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, uh, when there was only one state-owned media, and when we have tremendous amount of media houses operating online or on mainstream platform, the next question we need to ask is the question of credibility, the question of ethical reporting, that's why you know uh, journalists like Elias are taking the initiative to do the most important work of making sure there's balance in reporting, making sure that ethical procedures and processes of editing and producing content, if it's an online media or on mainstream mass media, is held accountable to its uh, truth mm -hmm. and to the quality of reporting that they do. So like you said, there's been similar trends when there is different regime change in Ethiopia. But what we witnessed in 2018 was the start of a very awesome transition into media liberalization. But right now we're seeing so many, the, the water is unclear for us to be able to tell whether the government is trying to go back to its instinct, like we've always witnessed, or if there is um, lack of credibility in reporting from the media side as well. Both of you mentioned the lack of professionalism and credibility from the media houses, Elias. Um, I mean, not to miss this golden opportunity that's opened up once in decades for the Ethiopian media. Just briefly, what should the media do not to miss this chance? I think uh, there are a number of things that uh, should be done, uh, not only by the media outlets themselves, but also by other stakeholders like the private sector um, uh, and also development partners. Uh, recently, we have established the Ethiopian Mass Media Professionals Association, which is comprised of more than 410 journalists, uh, both reporters and uh, or, uh, cameramen, photographers and stuff. So one of the idea behind this association was to uh, learn from each other and also to help raise the professionalism of uh, media professionals. Uh, I've been a journalist for more than 12 years in this country, uh, beginning from uh, a newspaper uh, here in Addis to becoming a correspondent for the Associated Press. Uh, through these years, I have seen that, I have witnessed that uh, um, there are some uh, journalists who just join the profession because they don't uh, have uh, any other means or uh, they, they don't want, uh, um, want to get employed in other fields. Uh, some of them even didn't study journalism. It doesn't mean that everybody who becomes a journalist should study journalism, but sometimes uh, you need to have a passion, I think, uh, to be a journalist. And with that comes uh, the professionalism itself. Also, uh, uh, for example, an economics or management or other discipline uh, graduate literally uh, becomes a journalist here in Ethiopia without getting any uh, training and stuff. And also there are no uh, enough trainings that are provided by, uh, even uh, f by the journalism schools that we have in Ethiopia. I haven't uh, heard of any training or um, uh, as such, uh, which is being executed by such uh, organs. Uh, I have witnessed the, the, the 
some activities in Kenya, for example, where journalists are getting a lot of trainings on fact-checking, on investigative journalism and stuff, which really helps journalists to develop their passion for the profession and also um, um, improve their professionalism. So I think media houses should take it very seriously. Uh, uh, it's a matter of life and death, I mean, for media outlets, because we are now seeing some media outlets who are getting out of business mm -hmm. uh, just because uh, people uh, don't have that much appetite for their news items because some of them are too much uh, uh, affiliated with uh, either they have ethnic affiliation or religious affiliation so that people consider them uh, not to be um, uh, impartial. So, uh, just to avoid this, I mean, uh, media houses should really uh, um, uh, improve uh, their capacity so that journalists get training and also development partners. Uh, I know in K Kenya, uh, for example, and also in South Africa, there are uh, several uh, media development uh, uh, companies who are providing training. So, I think we should step up this. Uh, in recent months, I have witnessed a number of them who are. Uh, who are uh, setting up office uh, here in Addis, uh, which I think is a good sign. Uh, they should also engage. And also, uh, from the government side, I think we have the, uh, previously it was called the Government Communication Affairs Office, now we have the Ethiopian Broadcast Authority, which uh, I think is doing a good job when it comes to giving uh, uh, licenses for different media outlets. Uh, the director is very accessible for a number of uh, journalists and also media houses from what I uh, witnessed for, for, from my interaction with him and uh, I think a lot of people have taken note of that but they should also engage more the media uh, in deliberations and also in uh, getting the voices of the media whenever there is a new policy or law which is uh, uh, being drafted by a government body so I think there should be a concerted effort between all these bodies otherwise uh, I think um, uh, the honeymoon uh, that we have witnessed uh, just last year uh, uh, will completely fade away uh, and uh, will cause more uh, problems in, in, in the coming days. Thank you, Elias. That's, that's very interesting. I, I think we are in a very critical moment uh, in this country and as you say, the concerted effort is needed both from the government, the developmental sector and also the private sector as well. Uh, let's move to the economic <clears throat> or the commercial aspects of the media business in this country. Samuel, let's go beyond politics and have a look at the economic or commercial forces at play. In 2019, the reform government banned beer ads of air. We know that the beverage companies used to contribute more than 50% of ad revenue for the broadcasters in particular. You've worked for Diageo, one of the largest uh, beverage company in this country, and you are also heading an ad agency at the moment. What are the effects of legislations like this on the commercial aspects of the media business in this country? We know of a couple of broadcast houses, for instance, the likes of JTV and LTV are off air. What should be done to increase the ad market in this country within the legal framework that we are allowed to play in? And how can we improve the economic play of media work, basically? So being at the foundation of every source of income that journalists and media houses earn is generated exclusively from advertising. And like you said, majority of this advertising comes from fast moving consumer goods in this country. Especially the beer industry contributed tremendously for supporting media houses, advertising agencies. Um, our portfolio yeah, at Spotlight Communications and Marketing over 20% of our revenue used to come from beer beverages uh, at the moment. Right now, we're not complaining, we're optimistic. We have an extremely diverse portfolio of clients, but that sort of decision needed to bring in a comprehensive number of stakeholders from the media, from advertising agencies, before that legislation was passed. So I feel the reason why the advertising was banned, whether it's a good reason or bad reason, that's not the most important point of our conversation. It needed to have a comprehensive number of stakeholders who come together, debate on this legislation before it was passed. Not only on um, beer advertising, but right now moving forward, what I want to point out is where attention goes brands also go. So the economic aspect of media management, the economic aspect of um, the media landscape in Ethiopia is very critical when it comes to understanding our target audience. The target audience for which you cater for determine the kind of products who want to advertise your product. A lot of people come to me 
when they ask us to sponsor their radio shows or they ask us to sponsor their TV or online programs, um, the one conversation we ask them is who are your target audience? So if a beverage product, for example, if a soda category product is trying to sponsor that product, what are the demographic and psychographic description of your target audience that you're targeting. Do they appeal to this product or not? So before journalists start to create any content of the product, they need to think of the economic base of sustaining their business. So who am I targeting? So when I'm targeting these audience, what are the kind of products that I'm trying to attract? Interesting. I think one of the things that we've seen in this country in recent years is there was a recent, I mean, a sudden boom of broadcasting houses in particular, in TV especially, but the advertisement base is not growing in equal terms. The advertisers were limited in number, but the number of TV stations suddenly became like 40, 30. So it's, it's very interesting what you mentioned, like diversifying your portfolio bases is very important and also targeting uh, the audience. Elias, would you like uh, to add anything on the economic side of uh, media business in this country? Yes, Samuel has raised a very important issue. Uh, one of the things which I noticed was uh, before the passing of this uh, legislation, I think there was not uh, enough uh, consultation uh, carried out with media houses, which uh, at the end of the day has impacted pretty much uh, their activities and some of uh, this has led to the closure of some media houses. So I think uh, this should become a blueprint uh, for uh, future legislations. Whenever there is uh, some uh, uh, law coming up, I think a relevant body should be uh, consulted. I mean, uh, this is also another sticking point which was raised frequently uh, uh, in the upcoming media law uh, that, uh, the, uh, that, the, uh, that is now being uh, in the pipeline. So uh, besides that, I think diversifying uh, also a source of uh, income for media houses is very important. Uh, what I'm witnessing right now is, for example, radio houses and uh, newspapers, TV stations, their online presence is very, very small. Uh, nowadays, if you see some YouTube channels or uh, some Facebook pages or, or, or also Twitter accounts, I mean, the presence of uh, these media houses is really, really uh, small. Uh, some, some individuals or activists have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers. So when you go to the, the social media pages, uh, it's very small. So somehow it has become a new uh, momentum for media houses to make business uh, from online uh, advertisements as well. Uh, so recently there was a discussion about this and uh, we were trying to, to take a look at the online presence of media houses. So literally, uh, especially some of the biggest ones that you will expect to have uh, millions of followers, literally they are non-existent uh, and they are not even uh, which uh, I believe they are not even uh, they haven't taken this seriously uh, as a way of making business. So I think they have to diversify and also see the other options that, uh, that they can the benefit that they can reap from online advertisements as well. Mm. Interesting. We'll look at, we'll look briefly at uh, social media, but just before jumping into that, uh, Samuel, there are a number of international players coming to this market. Um, satellite companies such as Utelsat and ACSR competing to get uh, the broadcasting houses, pay TV operators, multi-choice used to dominate this market for more than 20 years. Now we have Star Times, the Chinese Star Times, and the French Canal Plus is also joining the market. Even affiliations with production companies like Moby Group with Ghana Television, and even your company is affiliated to an international uh, ad agency. What's attracting international media companies to this market? And you can also briefly tell us about the affiliation that you've formed with uh, Endemol? Edelman. Edelman, yeah. So Spotlight has formed a formal affiliation agreement with the world's largest independent PR firm. They're called Edelman. Um, it's a global um, PR firm that's almost based throughout the world, but they're also trying to expand their presence in Africa. They have uh, affiliates all over the continent, but they also have offices in Kenya and South Africa. Um, like you said, there's a tremendous amount of players, international, multinational players that are coming into this market. The Ethiopian market has never been more attractive. The next few years is the most exciting time for media, production, communications, and public relations. And everyone in the rest of the world are looking at Ethiopia as their, as their go-to target for their next entry. This all depends on 
our country's uh, laws and regulations when it comes to doing business in this country for the media sector. Uh, but whatever it is, they're trying to form affiliations, they're trying to establish local presence in this country. SES, which happens to be a client of ours, have also entered the Ethiopian market through Etiosat. So over the next um, few years, free to air satellite would be dedicated to Etiosat because a lot of people are paying tremendous amount of foreign exchange. Uh, to you know, Utelsat or Nile uh, Sat or Arab Sat. So what Ethiosat, which is originally based in Luxembourg, SES, is trying to do is make sure local content creators have an opportunity to pay not only in dollars mm -hmm. but also in local currencies, which definitely changed the game for this country. Canal Plus and DSTV pay-to-play platform IPTVs are coming into this country massively because number one of our massive population, a youth target, which is really a great opportunity for Ethiopia to position itself as the as the greatest investment attraction in the media sector. My recommendation for everyone who's a local content creator is to step up our games in terms of content. Content is king. Um, not only stepping up in terms of content, but the quality of our production need to improve tremendously. It's how, over the next few years, there's gonna be some exciting changes in terms of affiliation, acquisition with international partners. Social media, as you mentioned, it's beyond traditional media broadcast press and the internet is becoming very influential in recent years. There are an estimated 6.2 million Ethiopians using social media in January 2020. The number of social media users in Ethiopia is increased by 237,000 between April and January. But it's infested with fake news and extreme views. You've been a lone voice in, ident in identifying fake news which has now grown to eat your check. Tell us briefly about it and uh, give us a bit of advice to the general audience about media literacy. You know, how can an individual, you know, differentiate between a fake news and a credible news? Because you're doing that. Uh, yeah, so um, I think uh, the, the issue of fake news is not a new one. I think it is something that has been around since uh, uh, humankind has been roaming the planet Earth because somehow uh, it has been there but it's now amplified, it has got a lot of attention because of um, the prevalence of this thing called social media, uh, especially the term fake news has become, become very popular after uh, the now US president uh, was campaigning uh, in 2016, so he, he, I think he coined the term. Uh, so social media is a great thing, uh, I mean it has uh, created a lot of opportunity for uh, hundreds, uh, of, hundreds of millions of people around the world. It has really uh, changed the way we interact with each other, it has created a lot of new developments, uh, but at the same time, uh, the creation, the, this phenomenon called fake news uh, is also becoming a real concern. Uh, as you know, it has created political turmoil in the United States, and also now we are witnessing that it has arrived uh, at our shores here in Ethiopia. Uh, so uh, the main thing is uh, we are discussing about fake news a lot because of the problems it is creating, uh, but at the same time, social media is, I hear some people blaming social media, but mm. it's not. Mm. But what we have to ask ourselves is uh, who's doing what to counter fake news? Uh, when, I, when we ask ourselves that question, I think we really lack uh, a lot of concerted infancy in Ethiopia. Uh, we have different media outlets uh, in the country, but when you take a look at their activities, I mean, there's not that much being done. Uh, I'm not, as you described, the lone um, uh, I mean, you are, you are almost the only one that I know yeah. of, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, I've been trying to do some stuff on social media uh, and also I have a radio program dedicated to fact check, uh, presenting fact check items. But now I'm seeing that there are some uh, initiatives from uh, both uh, Ethiopian media outlets and also from uh, outsiders uh, like Internews, which is uh, setting up office in Ethiopia. It's a good thing by itself, but I think um, a lot of things should be done, especially media houses, especially those who have the real capacity and also the knowledge about the issues they are keeping quite, and I think it is exacerbating the problem that we are having here. So uh, fact-checking training should be given to journalists. Recently there was one which I uh, uh, taken part here in Ethiopia. I've taken a number of them both here in Ethiopia and also outside of the country, but if you go to media houses and ask journalists if, you, if they know the 
um, the techniques, uh, the how to of to fact check. I think uh, that's when you see the problem is m most people are not uh, aware of the even the tools that are used to fact check items. So I think that's a very important thing that should be given attention. And I think the government should also uh, take part in this, especially the broadcast authority, because it has a lot of report uh, contacts and also even the resources. So it should help private media houses. Uh, and also, um, uh, I should mention here that um, uh, despite all the uh, challenges that I face, I think one of the problems is that not getting enough uh, support for uh, fact-checking items. When you ask journalists, why don't you do this and that, then they will ask you about the incentives uh, uh, of doing this fact-checking. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, there, there should also be incentive for journalists to engage themselves in fact-checking. Otherwise, you know, they are also preoccupied with producing news items for their media houses, and at the same time, it, when you ask them to do fact checking, they will say, okay, I'm pretty busy here, so I'm not uh, able, I don't have the time to do that. So I think there should be that incentive. I think, for example, Facebook in other countries will pay reporters to fact check items, uh, especially if you are a member of the International Fact Checking Network. So uh, I don't know of any uh, journalist in Ethiopia who is a member of that and who is doing this. So uh, when you give journalists the opportunity both to benefit themselves and also to do uh, fact checking, I think, uh, we'll have a better environment, but uh, that's not happening. But now um, uh, both PESA Check and Africa Check are trying to expand here, and now we have Ethiopia Check, which was an initiative that I started a couple of months back, but now Internews approached me and they said, why don't we make this uh, project so that we will hire more people and uh, we will work together. So now Ethiopia Check has become an Internews project. So besides yeah. my affiliation with, uh, with the AP and also mm -hmm. <coughs> the Ethiopian Mass Media Professional Association, I'm also serving as the editor of Ethiopia Check. So we are trying to do our best. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So now you're partnering with Internews to launch Ethiopia Check? It's already launched. It's now already we are launched. trying to set up okay. an office here uh, after finalizing all okay. the necessary requirements from the Ethiopian Broadcast yeah. Authority. Yeah. So people can have access to Ethiopia Check on www. Uh, it's, it, uh, so, uh, right. since it's a new project, now yeah. we have launched it already uh, uh, two weeks ago on social okay. media. So, Ethiopia Check is now available. Uh, you can already see uh, some of the work that we have produced. Yeah. Uh, it's on Facebook, Telegram, and Twitter. It's Ethiopia Check. But uh, now we are developing a website called ethiopiacheck.com and also a mobile application. After that, we will uh, also uh, have a YouTube channel. And after that, I mean, uh, step by step, we are planning to have uh, some slots in TV stations and radio stations, which is called Ethiopia Check, so that we will have some. Uh, uh, so some of our uh, productions will also be freely distributed for media outlets for them to use it by quoting Ethiopia Check. So we want to start to spark the conversation around social media and fake news, so that you know people will become aware. As you know, in Ethiopia. If something is written on Facebook, then that's the fact. That's the problem. So uh, people should realize that uh, there are some bad actors on social media. Yes, social media is very beneficial, but at the same time, uh, people shouldn't believe uh, whatever is written on social media. So we want people to let, to let them know that uh, what are the tools they should, uh, they should deploy to fact check something, and which are the pages, which are, who are, who is doing what on social media. So by having this conversation, uh, we want to make people aware that whatever is written on social media is not correct. As you mentioned, the internet penetration uh, is very low. Um, I think I have a slightly different figure from what you came up with. Uh, last time there was training in Kampala in Uganda, uh, late 20. Uh, I heard from them that uh, there are around 7.5 million active Facebook users in Ethiopia, and uh, as you all know, the internet penetration is around 50 million. But um, we are witnessing all these problems with just 15 percent penetration. So what, what worries me the most is what will happen in this country when we reach the level of Kenya, uh, who have like massive number of social media users, uh, which is around 88 percent, I guess, or the likes of uh, Egypt and South Africa. So I think there should be uh, something done uh, from the, this moment. I mean, uh, otherwise, if you just sit idle and see how things unfold, I think um, we'll see more violence, more problems, and more fake news coming out and also causing all this tension that we are witnessing uh, in the political atmosphere throughout the country. Interesting. That's very interesting. And I think we should be grateful for what you're doing in fact checking. And good luck with ETO Check. So uh, Samuel, some brands are migrating to the, to the digital platforms now, you know, and they're becoming smart in, you know, getting out their messages to their target audiences and tell us briefly about what Spotlight is doing on digital sphere. Mm. 
So Spotlight is currently the largest digital marketing agency in Ethiopia in terms of number of portfolio that we're running. We've literally transformed social media marketing for fast moving consumer goods product. We run over 20 famous portfolios online manage their communities, create their content, devise their strategies, and write their copywriting. And one thing I always say is social media provides a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to transform the country. Elias is talking about how disinformation and misinformation slash fake news is the biggest battle net for the democratization process in this country. And all the conversation and dialogue on social media is not exclusively limited to news and information. There are so many people who are making tremendous amount of money. So many entrepreneurs who are changing their life on social media platform. Social media gives you the opportunity right now after this recording session, this is going on online platforms, on YouTube, on social media. The future of content creation is completely transformed because of social media. When we look at the positive side of social media, right now Ethiopia has the 2025 um, digital transformation strategy in order for us to be able to accomplish that ambitious objective. The one thing we need to do is create a digital savvy youth. Um, what Elias is doing in terms of teaching people how to discern fake news and fact checking and using the necessary tool to understand the difference between accurate information, misinformation and disinformation is very critical education that we need to incorporate um, in our training for journalists and in our training for every stakeholder who's involved in creating content in this country. I think the uh, association that Elias is leading at the moment 410 members with it is extremely critical for us to fully transform. If we have quarterly based training on them being able to migrate on social media platform, these ethical and professional journalists need to migrate into the digital space. When it comes to brands migrating into the digital space, it's inevitable. Where attention goes, brands go. Remember when you, uh, you used to watch YouTube in peace and there's literally no ad on it a few years ago? We will find you as advertisers. Our job is when you're watching TV, we come to your living room. When you're listening to the radio, we come to your house. When you're on your mobile phone, we come to your mobile phone. And when you're watching YouTube, aha, this guy's spending tremendous amount of his time on YouTube, on Telegram. That's where my product needs to come. So there is uh, an evolution rather a revolution of coming onto the digital platform. That's why um, journalists like Elias have massive number of followings. Right now he has over 65K followers on Telegram only. And six months ago, it was 32K. You can imagine in the next five years, the more followers you have, the more you have the ability to lead their narrative. I have to have my brand invade his space. So for him to be able to give me accurate information, the best thing about social media marketing is you get the right targeting. You get demographic-based targeting, you get pixel targeting, you get gender-based targeting. So you literally would find any target consumers that you want for a specific product, and it's amazing return on your investment. Thank you so much. I think that's a very interesting point. We are approaching our end, uh, and I would like to end with a positive note. Media consumption is on the rise in this country. A media mapping recent survey of multinational company in 12 major cities and towns shows um, TV consumption has grown to about 64%. Uh, even internet connection is, has reached about 22%, I don't know, according to Ethiopia Telecom. Internet-based media engagement is also on the rise. As you said, more than 7 billion people are on social media. So closing remarks from both of you. What should the media do? What is expected of the government? And most importantly, how should the public engage with the media? Uh, I think um, uh, the first thing that we should realize is um, uh, whatever uh, people uh, write uh, on social media, there is some intention behind it mm -hmm. for everything that we saw as a post on social media, uh, whatever it is, whether it's YouTube or a Facebook post or Twitter or Telegram, which is becoming very popular in Ethiopia nowadays. Um, people should take uh, a second uh, look at uh, those posters. They should consider who is this person who is making this post. They should consider that there are some people who have some agenda, who, who have some thought or some uh, thing that they want to convey. So instead of disseminating it uh, for uh, others, like uh, by in the form of sharing or telling uh, in a word of mouth, 
they should consider that there could be something behind it. So I'm not saying that people should be very um, cautious on every, whenever they engage themselves on social media, but uh, from what I've seen in social media, especially in the past uh, couple of years, I mean, social media is becoming toxic because of um, some stuff that's being posted on social media by, by just a few number of people. Other than that, as you mentioned, uh, now social media has uh, created a tremendous amount of space for uh, business people. Uh, I know uh, a journalist uh, who was working in a certain media outlet, now he created that media, and now he's making, uh, if you be believe it, I mean, more than 100 thousand birth per month. He was just being employed for uh, 10,000 birth. Now he has all the freedom that he wants. Uh, I mean, he can work from home, but now he's making, uh, I mean, it's a lot of money for a lot of Ethiopians. So, I mean, people, could, yeah, the youth can be creative on social media. There are some Telegram channels. Uh, there is Tikva, if you know it. I mean, like it has like more than one million followers. And the influence that is having, and which I'm gladly, uh, is a very positive influence that they are having by disseminating uh, verified information. So, I mean, we need people like that to, who, to be very creative and also to make money out of it. Uh, other than that, I mean, uh, for those people who are, I mean, disseminating fake news and um, creating havoc uh, here and there, I mean, uh, fact-checking is, I think, the, the right response for it. And um, as you, you mentioned, I have started some initiative, and I mean, uh, I want to invite other journalists who I think really have the capacity and also the knowledge uh, to, to, to do it. I mean, I would like to invite all of them to engage in this uh, fight uh, so that we'll have uh, very... Uh, uh, a nice atmosphere in which social media is, is used very uh, nicely and the way we want it to be. Perfect. Thank you so much. Samuel, any uh, concluding remarks? So, yeah, there is, for example, if we get in a studio in South Africa, you're going to see live Twitter feed on their TV right in front of you because their media approach is extremely interactive uh, with their audience. It's very important that every media in this country creates an interactive dialogue, whether it's on the radio, on TV, or on social media platforms. That link you create between mainstream media and social media is the future in terms of brands, in terms of advertising, in terms of product positioning as well. In terms of advising Ethiopians to understand not only discerning fake news, uh, misinformation and disinformation, but also the positive usage of social media. You can make a life and a living out of social media, especially the youth right now. Instead of being focused on certain news information, let's leave that for journalists and for professionals. It's very important to utilize the positive aspect of social media. Um, this, this interview is going to go online. And it would really be nice for us, you know, to get comments on this feedback, to continue the dialogue and the conversation. It's not just up to Benya, it's not just up to Elias to talk about fact checking, to talk about uh, discerning fake news in our country. It's very important that we have an open dialogue and understand that it's the huge bottleneck for the democratization process in our country. We have come to an end. Thank you for watching and thank you both for your contribution. Elias Masarat, correspondent to the Associated Press and president of Ethiopian Mass Media Professionals Association, and Samuel Bakala, CEO of Spotlight Communications. Next time, we'll be back with another topics and another guests. Until then, goodbye from me, Benyas Meso, and the team at Hadis Matters.